Peace of the Sabbath unto you. Shalom, shalom to everyone. Perfect peace. And um, it's, it's 26 3, not 46 3. From Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. So our, our challenge always is to see from God's perspective and to hear what God has to say to us. And I believe it's an every day, every moment challenge that we have. What is God doing? What are you seeing that God's doing? Are you hearing God speak to you? And are you being transformed from one degree of glory to the next? And our, our Torah passage tonight, uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more later, but it's about seeing. Do you see? That's the first word of the parasha. So that's what this is. Um, <coughs> the Hebrew word is re'ah. R-E-E-H. And I'm probably not pronouncing it right, but you know, really, if you think about it, when we see the Lord, He shows us what we're to see. This, this Torah passage tonight is, is packed full of so many wonderful things, like really every one of them are, and as we begin to see God work and move, and, you know, so we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit, but, so welcome, welcome to Shema Israel, which means hear, O Israel, hear God, that's about hearing God. So when you hear God, he, he uses all of your senses, your sight, your hearing, what you smell, what you taste. You know, he says to us to come and, and taste and see what he's done because he tells us that the land that he's prepared for us is a land of milk and honey. And we're, we're to see from that perspective. And every day, hopefully we're we're transformed. We're no longer our old self. We're being transformed from one degree of glory to the next so that we can be yet a new creation in Christ, in Yeshua, in Jesus. And that's really what, what God has for us. And um, I, would, I would just invite, as we, we set aside this time, we set aside what God has for us, we'll hear Him, we'll see Him, we'll see Him high and lifted up. Something wrong? You need some water? Okay. Well, we have water, that's good. It's okay. We're, we're a family, and we're here really, if, if one among us isn't doing well, then none of us are doing well. And if you need a drink of water, you need a drink of water. So um, thanks be to God. So we're going to pray, and then we're going to do our, our usual things. Um, we're going to have, as you see, the parashah, and we're going to have the shofar. <laughs> so. Father God, as we come before you tonight, thankful for your grace to us, thankful that you are the Father of lights, in whom there's no variableness, no shadow of turning. Lord, help us to remember that you are the great I Am, that you are the great and wonderful God, our counselor, our provider, that you provide everything we need for life, and for godliness through your son, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Thank you, Lord, that we're called out of the world to be your messengers to the world that we live in. To every person that we come across that we're to you know, speak peace, and as much as possible for us to be at peace with every person that we're around. Thank you, Lord, for tonight and that you transform us. I just pray that we would get that sense of glory 
and use it so that we so that opens a door of heaven to us that we might really take seriously what you have for us and what you want from us and how you want us to live and think and act and breathe and move in you. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. Uh, we ask your presence here as we as we worship you in spirit and truth. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Uh, we ask these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, we have a show for all.
much alone. Just a couple of announcements. You know, we're we on the month of uh, uh, and actually the tour passage has something to say about it uh, as well. So um, tonight, as we prepare, this is a period of preparation for the new year. We're in preparation for the new year, which is Rosh Hashanah, which will be on Friday night at sundown, the 15th of September, we'll be celebrating the new year. So we're going to be here in this building. We don't know if we're going to be here, there, or anywhere. We're going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, we don't know. We don't know the day or the hour. And I think we're, anybody that says that they do is in trouble. I think that's, that's what I read the scripture to say. So, um, also, the 22nd isn't Yom Kippur. The, the Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, uh, the day that if some people have a ritual fast, and if you can, you might want to fast completely or partially. And that actually starts on Sunday, the 24th, but we're going to have a service on the 22nd for um, Yom Kippur and to talk about the meaning of Yom Kippur and the meaning of, of fasting and, and praying and whatever else God teaches us and wants to have us to learn. So, and then on the 29th is actually the first night of Sukkot. And we know that that's one of three holidays that Jewish families and men were supposed to go to Jerusalem to celebrate the three festivals. So we can meet there? We can meet, we can meet we, we, I would love to meet in Jerusalem, believe me. Um, However, there's a, like a little walk that they do at the beaches, like the, the, the walk that Jesus did. Yes, at the oh, at okay. what, he, what he said is, at Shields Day Garden, there's oh. a walk yes. outside where, of, um, <coughs> where you can walk and kind of like mm -hmm. the steps of yes. Yeshua um, at various times in his life. So, but it's not really, it's not really related to the festivals that I know of. But it's a great walk to take if you haven't done it. Um, and even if you have done it, it's a great walk to take. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we could go at the group and uh, not related to the festival. So sometime we could, we could make, when it cools off a little bit more. Yes, we'll make Aliyah to Shields. <laughs> 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 oh, so we're going to go claim the land as shields, and we're going to say, this is our land. <laughs> this is my land. Anyway. We'll take shields. The land of shakes. The land of shakes. Yeah. So that's so going to be trees tonight, because he does that song. Who's going to be a date tree? A date tree. <laughs> we're going to be trees in the field. Oh, that's right. So anyway, so... Shalom, and we'll worship the Lord together now. Well, thanks for everybody coming. You know, the sun is just going down now. Yes, it is. Perfect. I mean, thanks for getting me great too. So, Tony, I was thinking about you today, and here you are. Thank and you so for thinking about I, I wanted to open up with a couple of celebration songs. So, in the presence of your people, I will praise you. Stand up if you can. 
Yeah. 
to me, open to me, open to me, the gates of righteousness said, open up, open up, open up, open up, open to me, open to me. Open to me, the gates of righteousness and open to me, open to me, open to me, the gates of righteousness and I will go through them, I will praise the Lord, I will go through them, I will praise the Lord, open to me. To me, the gates of righteousness and open to me, open to me, open to me, the gates of righteousness and open up, open up, open up, open up, open. Up. open. Open to me, open to me, the gates of righteousness are open to me, open to me, open to me, the gates of righteousness are open up, open up. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Selah! So be it.
ago, I told the group that night that I always love to leave worship on Father's Day because of the Father heart of God. And you know, when I first got saved, I fell in love with Yeshua. And then I discovered the love of the Father. I have never been the same. So I'm going to sing the song I did that night. It's written by some young people. And they have read this little devotional that was basically Good Morning Abba. And after they read this little book, they wrote the song. It's become one of my favorite over the last few years.
in, in years past, only kings had time and energy and money to search things out. But all of you have time every day. You know, we have so many conveniences. We don't have to spend four hours a day getting water or four hours a day making a, a fire. We don't have to spend eight hours a day to just to be clean. You know, so today we have plenty of time, each of us, and so we are without excuse in terms of our seeking after God. And I'm speaking to myself as well. Um, then, you know, this all, it goes on to say, here are the laws and rulings that you are to observe in the land Adonai, the God of your ancestors, who's given you to possess as long as you live on the earth. That's the first verse out of uh, chapter 12 of Deuteronomy. And so he wants us to possess the land that we live in, to possess what we have, to live in it and take hold of it and realize everything that we have. And again, we get to choose blessing or cursing, just like we get to choose whether we're happy. Even though happiness is not necessarily a promise, we get to choose happiness. We get to choose joy. So look like you're looking for joy, but you might be surprised by joy in the morning. You may have tears at night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. So everything that God has for you, and then in chapter 13 it says, everything I'm commanded you are to take care of, to do. And do not add to it, or do not subtract from it. So what's here is what we're to live in and with. We're to live and move and have our being in the Word of God. That's really his purpose. And, you know, you could go through all these verses. And chapter 14 says, the first verse, You are the people of Adonai your God. You are not to gnash yourselves or shave the hair above your foreheads in mourning for the dead, because you are people set apart as holy for Adonai your God. Adonai your God has chosen you to be his own unique treasure out of all the peoples on the face of the earth. So each one of you is part of this unique group of people that God's called you because he's called you to be together with the Jewish people. And some of us are Jewish, some of us aren't. He's called you to be together with the people that are set apart. We're to set ourselves apart. And I'm not saying it's a formula, because God's not a formulaic God, but yet He does operate in certain principles. So, so think about that one a little bit, because it's, it's actually very deep. And verse 15 says, at the very end, every seven years you are to have a Shemitah. Here is the smi how the Shemitah is to be done. Every creditor is given up what he has loaned to his fellow member of a community. He is not to force his neighbor or his relative to repay it, because Adonai's time of remission has been proclaimed. And you know, this was a this was God's economy at one point. We don't we don't live in that economy anymore, but that was how God wanted the economy to work. Um, and um, I, I misspoke. This passage does not speak about uh, this month, does it? Okay. Yeah, about. about this month. Oh, but uh, yes, because it is the two eyes. It's it's the hearing, it's the hearing, and it is the the, the left eye. So we can see and hear. We can see. Well, but but it's not. I guess what I was doing. I thought it doesn't actually mm -hmm. mention this month in the Torah passage. Mm -hmm. Indirectly it does. Yes, yes. And really, uh, but all, all of the scripture really, it's, it's a complete picture. It's, it's a tapestry and we just, we have to see from God's perspective. Um, so, uh, but we do know that, um, that God wants us to prepare ourselves as, as we go forward. And um, the final verses of this particular Torah passage is what I was referring to earlier about the festivals. It says, three times a year, all your men are to appear in the presence of Adonai, your God, in the place which he will choose. <clears throat> at the festival of Matzah, at the festival of Shavuot, 
at the Fet festival of Sukkot, which is we're going to celebrate on the 29th. That's the first night of Sukkot. They are not to show up before Adonai empty-handed. So you are to ask God what you are to bring. So ask God now and say to him, okay, Lord, you're telling me that I'm not supposed to show up empty-handed, so what am I supposed to bring? What do you want me to bring? Each one of you have gifts and talents and treasure. And I don't know what God's asking, and I don't presume to know what God's asking you to bring, but he's asking you to bring to him, you know, sometimes it's just yourself, um, but... Every man is to give what he can in accordance with the blessing that and I, your God, has given you. So that's just part of this particular Torah passage. And again, you know, all the, the Torah passages are, are so powerful. And really, I think, for me, I still go back to the basics of what God's called us to do. He's called us to be a people, we're a called out group to reach the Jew, especially, and equally to the Gentile. Right, Jade? Yes. <laughs> anyway, so um, to God, to God's glory, um, we're going to have our, our dear sister share. So, shalom. Shalom. He looks at me and he starts laughing. <laughs> you did well there's so much in the parasha and you know all of them like you say but some it just seems like there's so much packed in it's just very very hard to cover and last week we started late we got Michelle up here late and Michelle said okay this time we're gonna jump in because I wanted to bring to you from the Haftor portion last week that's the portion that comes after the first five books, the, the prophetic, the prophet books that, that we read from. Because we're in the seven Shabbats building up toward Rosh Hashanah. And we're already to the third one. So forgive me for going back. I will also go forward at the same time. And I guarantee you, because the handwriting's on the wall once again, we won't finish chapter uh, 40 of Yeshayahu, but you might want to open to Isaiah chapter 40 because I will be heavily going through that um, verse by verse. It's an amazing um, chapter of comfort, just absolutely amazing. Um, I just want to bring out a couple more things from our parsha tonight. First, as it builds into it, we've already talked about the, re uh, uh, or however I should say it, Janet probably can correct both Bruce and I, but the, the C. And yet when we read that beginning, the you see is singular. Each one of us, you see. But then when it talks about the before you, what you're seeing before you, that second you, is in the plural. So you go from a singular to a plural in that one sentence. And the idea behind it is that for every, and, and this is particularly when we're talking to Israel, we're talking to the Jewish nation. But we know that in our Messianic time here, our Gentiles are grafted in, so it still is going to apply. But for the Jewish people, the same way that they were to all feel that we stood with Moshe at Mount Sinai when he got the commandments given to us, we were all there. You're supposed to feel like that's exactly how it was. You picture yourself there, and he was speaking to you directly, God giving the commandments to you directly. In this, you see, and before you, the idea is that every Jewish person has a responsibility toward every other Jewish person. That's why we go from the singular to the plural. That we really are a family. We are a unit. And we are to look for how we can help each other. If we see someone that does need correction, it needs to be gentle and loving correction. But we need to help bring them in because we're responsible for each other. We can't just let someone go off and not care. This is so fundamental to Judaism. It's so fundamental to the Jewish way of thinking. It's so fundamental to the Jewish family that to see it here and to realize it and to realize that the responsibilities that go along with it fit right along with what we're going to be bringing out tonight because as it builds us, it gives our direction how to live. 
really, for our Jewish people, they live by the calendar. And they know what to do because of the calendar. They know the preparation for the next holy day. They know that Shabbat is coming again. They, they have all of this. And of course, on top of it, our kosher laws. Tonight's uh, parsha has the firstborn and how the firstborn is consecrated to God. And as Bruce said, the three pilgrimages that we're supposed to, to all go up. So we, we are getting our whole way of thinking, of, of walking, of talking, of acting. And yet, even though each one individually is supposed to see it between God and you individually, at the same time, you're to reach out and see it as the community. And how can we help each other along that pilgrimage together? And as we come into this third Shabbat, you know, we had the three that were rebuked before. But now we've got three and we're going to have seven in totality that are speaking on comfort. And we go into the Hoff Torah. They're still in Yeshiahu and Isaiah. They're, this week they're in chapter 54 instead of 40. I'm going to bring out just a tiny bit from 54 and then kind of right back into 40. Because it ties in so beautifully. It starts out in chapter 54 and verse 11. I got the wrong tab open. Oh, afflicted. Oh, I'm sorry, oh afflicted one, storm tossed and not comforted. That's who the prophet was speaking to. If you're feeling right now in your life afflicted, if you're feeling storm tossed, if you're feeling the insecurity and the waves are buffeting you, this message is for you. And all the way through, even though it was given to the nation of Israel, and at a strategic time, because Yeshahu is the prophet who's speaking to them when they're going to go into captivity because they've been disobedient. The handwriting's more than on the wall. It's done if they're on their way into captivity, and yet God has a message of hope for them. He has a message of comfort. So we're going to look at the fact that he speaks to those who feel that they are in stormy waters. And yet, as we move on into our Brit Chodesh, we're going to see that it speaks of a different type of water. It speaks of living water. And I'll come back to that in a moment, but in our Haftor portion, we have Yerushalayim, that yeah, Isaiah is saying it's going to be desolate. But in this portion, when you read chapter 54, if you, keep, if you go back to the beginning and you read through it, it speaks of the time that Jerusalem foundation will be diamonds and sapphires and precious jewels. It's not going to stay desolate. Yes, punishment is coming, but God has a future and a hope. We saw that, we heard that in Yermia, and he tells us, incline your ear. Here's our Shema again. Hear the Lord. Hear him, even in a time of correction. You need to have your ear open, and you need to be hearing. And he says, I have given you an everlasting covenant. There is no room to say that God has finished with Israel, turned his back on Israel, is done with Israel, is not going to bring her promises. He says that in the midst of you're going off into captivity because you've been so honoring, and yet I've made an everlasting covenant with you. And to see that fulfillment, to come into the, the where the promises will be received for Israel is one criteria. She has to accept her Messiah. She has rejected him, but she will accept him. That day is coming. And that's why in chapter 55 of Yeshua, it says in verse 1, all who are thirsty come to the water. Now, notice it didn't say come to the storm-tossed water. Anyone want to take a drink of water out of a boat that's tossing, you know, stick it in the ocean to, to get a cup? If you're doing anything, you're bailing it out <laughs> as fast as you can. But it's changed. It's come all who are thirsty. Come to the water. You, without money, come, buy and eat. How do you buy without money? Well, basically what God is saying is, you buy it for free. It's being given to you. Come as you are. You don't have to have money. You don't have to have anything. You can buy wine and milk without money. That's the, the delicacies. You can have it all. And it's spelled out specifically, it's free. What living water is free? And if you aren't there, let me just take you all the way to the, the, the final book, Revelation, the revealing of Messiah, the revealing of Yeshua HaMashiach, 
very last chapter, almost the last verse. We're going to chapter 22 and verse 17, and we hear the spirit and the bride say, and we know the spirit's the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. The bride then is obviously Yeshua, um, but we're, he's our bride. We're his bride. He's telling the bride, saying, come, let anyone who hears say, come. Shema, are you hearing? Come. Let anyone who is thirsty come. Oh, I remember Isaiah said that. And then it says, let anyone who wishes take the water of life free of charge. Same verbiage. We've got Yeshua and we've got Revelation. We have the original covenant and we have the British the new covenant, both speaking about this living water that's free. And then if you know, you know that there is a celebration called a water libation ceremony. It's part of Sukkot. We'll teach on it more when we come to Sukkot. But in just brevity, they have for seven days, they have been going down to the pool of Siloam with a gold pitcher, bringing up this water, coming to the temple area, pouring the water out into a silver basin. It is the, they say, if you've never participated, you don't know what joy is. There's dancing, there's singing, all of the instruments are playing, the, the people are just alive. The menorahs, 75 foot tall menorahs are burning and the lights are going. It's an extravagant and they're shouting and they're singing and they're praising and they're pouring out this water. And a couple of key things that they say. One comes from Isaiah again, chapter 12 and verse 3. Therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the well of salvation. Oh, draw water out. And it's talking about, there's nowhere it's saying that you're being charged. They're freely taking water out of the well of salvation. And at the time of this ceremony taking place, when Yeshua was in Jerusalem, he stood up. And our scriptures tells us, tell us, it's in Yochanan John chapter 7, that with a loud voice he cried out. Why with a loud voice? You ever been in the middle of a celebration? Is it quiet? No. Remember, the minstrels have their instruments going, and the women are dancing, and the men are singing, and they're shouting, and they're, they're, all the, the, the ceremony is going on. And he wanted to be heard. So he had to speak loudly. And he cries out to them, and he tells them that any who are thirsty to come to him, drink from him, he would give them living waters, and they would thirst no more. All of this is in here. What a comfort. Have you ever been thirsty? When you are really, really thirsty. If I offer you a glass of milk, are you happy? If I offer you a cup of coffee, are you happy? <laughs> but if I offer you a nice glass of cool, refreshing, straight from the spring as God made it water. You know, when you're thirsty, nothing quenches your thirst but what God has made. And what a picture it is, nothing quenches our thirst. Nothing brings us comfort. When you need comfort, there is one source. And I guarantee you, you'll not find it in the stormy waters, but in your stormy waters, and when you come and freely take you will suddenly find that your stormy waters are now calm. And you can drink to your delight. That's what's behind all this. Jumping into that with that being the, what they're thinking as they're continuing, they've had the opportunity to go through chapter 40. They've built on it. We're backing up for that, but this is the crescendo where you're going. Remember, every Shabbat now, we until Rosh Hashanah, we talk about the restoring of the Jewish people to their land. Remember, in Isaiah, they're going out. They're going to be exiles. We talk about the return. Do you realize we're living in a diaspora? Janet, where do we belong? Israel. In Israel. We're here. We belong in Israel. We're in the diaspora. And God takes them to a time when he's going to bring them home from the four corners of the earth. They're going to come. They're going to come miraculously by angels helping. They're going to come by people putting them on their shoulders and carrying them. It is going to be, if you think the celebration, that water migration celebration was something, wait till you see that. 
We talk about the future redemption of Israel. That's very, very important. Israel's going to be redeemed. How is she going to be redeemed? Stay tuned. We're talking about the coming Messianic era. And as you know that and have that in your mind, and now go with me to chapter 40 and verse 1. And we will not get through the chapter tonight. Thomas will laugh at me, but we won't do it, and I know it. <laughs> so we're going to come back and we're going to finish it off next week. But there's a point I want to get you to because if we can take this together, I guarantee you, it ends with the eagles and you will be flying with the eagles if you have a heart that, that the Lord is able to talk to. Isaiah chapter 40 is messianic and it's future. It's a, a miraculous restoration of the exiles back into their land and the Jewish people being comforted. When we left off at chapter 39, we've left off with Babylonian captivity. Ten northern tribes, Assyria had taken them off into captivity. Two southern stayed and then they went off into idolatry the same way their brothers did. And so God said, okay, it's the same thing. If, you, if I didn't let your brothers get away with it, you really think I'm going to let you get away with it? You're going into captivity too. Maybe when you're out there in the captivity of the nations that don't love you, maybe then you'll realize you need to turn back to the God who loves you and the God who has promised you the promised land and more. So today they go from lamenting for Yerushalayim and our hearts do cry. It is the eternal capital of, of Israel. Absolutely is. I'm thrilled. Paraguay is moving their embassy back to Jerusalem. They had it there in 2018. They moved it out and sent it back to Tel Aviv. It's been a, a, a schism between the two countries, and the new leadership is coming into Paraguay. Talked to Netanyahu and said, the very first action I am taking as the head of the country is we are moving back into Yerushalayim where your capital is. And he went on basically to say, why should we tell Israel where their capital should be? Really? So, hallelujah. We see a victory there, but the whole world is going to see. The whole world is going to recognize Jerusalem will be restored. All of Israel will be saved, and she will be saved from her enemies. <coughs> Notice I say it in plural. Israel has enemies on every side, and she even has them within, because there are those within that are not there in favor of the Jewish people being there. That's nothing compared to the tribulation time that will come, but all that I'm telling you, we haven't seen anything like that millennial reign. 1,000 years. Now, I'm going to ask you, when has this earth seen one year? of she, uh, shalom, of peace. One year. Month? Yeah. <laughs> Have we had a day? <laughs> I, I think somewhere there's always something going on. The whole earth will have this shalom. Wow. Israel will be a ransomed people. And that's what we're seeing in chapter 40. And when we start off with chapter 40, it starts off immediately, comfort you, comfort you. This is what I'm giving you to bring you comfort. We do believe that this was prophetically spoken twice to talk about the destruction of our first temple and our second temple. That it, it's believed that that's why God had it ordained that, that it was spoken twice. Notice who is saying it, who's saying to be comforted. It's coming from your God. I love that. It's not even just coming from the God. It's coming from your God, Israel. You're still his people. He's bringing you comfort. And he's going to show you how you're going to experience that comfort. So we go on with this. And let me explain to you the word comfort first, though. <coughs> nachum is a word in Hebrew. And that means nachum, N-A-C-H-U-M. I keep thinking I've got to remember to write out these words somehow. One day I'll get there. It's to console yourself. The idea behind it is it's really almost a command. You are to be comforted. It's not a choice. You are to be. And it's to be taken in the same way that telling Psalm 23 and verse 4 says, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. God uses them to comfort the people. And when you go into the, the depth of the meaning, 
have you ever been in a time of perplexity, a time when you're needing that comfort and that peace, and it finally you get the breakthrough? And what do we, I don't care if we're Chinese or Jewish or American or Italian, what do we commonly all do? Yeah. <sighs> a big sigh of relief. That's what this word comfort is. That in the midst of your sorrow, in the midst of whatever God is reaching out with compassion, and he's bringing you comfort, and he wants you to experience it personally, and so much so that you breathe that sigh of relief. How can you know that comfort? You have to know your God. How do you know your God? You have to be in his word. That's why he says, hear, hear, hear. Hear the word of God. Remember, they didn't have the privilege of reading it. They didn't have it. I've got I don't know how many Bibles in my home. They didn't have that privilege. There were few scrolls. They were precious scrolls, and that's even down in time, not even initially in the beginning. Moshe gets the commandments straight from God. That's what they've got. But here, because the word would be spoken out. And for us, what a privilege. Use your eyes and your ears that we've talked about tonight. Use both. Read his word. Hear his word. Get his word into you. Why? Because that word, I love the word of God. That word is inerrant. Can you pick up any book and know 100% stake your life on it? Every word is true and you can, you can bake everything on it, everything that matters. When the, those who do the stock market love a book like that. <laughs> but God says, my word is inherent, and it covers every area of need in your life. But if you don't get into it, you don't know what it's saying. The same way that when you become a believer in Yeshua, it, someone said it's like you just got the deed to a mind. It's yours. You can put up a sign that says, Rochelle is mine. And if that's all you do, okay, for whatever reason, whoop-de-doo came into my mind. <laughs> but if I get in there and I start digging, I might find gold, I might find silver, I might find all kinds of precious treasures, but I need to dig them out. It's all mine. God has given you everything that you need in salvation, but if you don't dig it out and get into it, then how can you be comforted? That would be like trying to say that the baby that's crying in the house and the mom is on the outside, the mom can just say, well, be comforted, be comforted, and that baby's going to go on and do what? Cry. Holler and scream and cry. But if mom can come in and mom can pick up that baby, oh, the comfort, the comfort. I remember my little nephew, we had a big meeting going on, and word came out from the, the one we were hearing crying in the nursery was my nephew. I couldn't go, but his Grammy heard that it was her grandson, <laughs> and my mom found a way to get to that nursery, and as soon as she picked that little guy up, those buckets of tears stopped, and he was a happy little camper. That's what God wants to do. He wants to pick you up, and he wants to bring you comfort. But if you're not in his word, that's what equips you for life. Life is going to have its, its, its source, its troubles. It's going to have ups and downs. You're going to say, oi, some days you're going to say, oi, the vault other days. And I think I said that one today myself. But the word of God. It's alive, it is powerful, it is sharper than a two-inched sword, which means that it can cut right through the most slice, right to the inner recesses of your heart. You think you've got a secret from God? Ha! He knows. So why don't you talk to him about it? Why don't you tell him what you're thinking? Why don't you have it out if you need to with him? Because he will bring you to his word that will correct you, or breakthrough for you, or change you. His word, it, it's a lie. He's promised you life. He's promised you abundant life. If you're not living an abundant life, it's not God's fault, okay? It's not, it's there for you. It's there for you to take. The more you need, the more you need to dig in. This is the help in time of need. This is, just immerse yourself. And immerse yourself in this chapter now because the key 
verse here, where the key words are right here. Notice who's speaking. Thus says the Lord. Not Rochelle, not any one of you. Thus says the Lord. That's all that matters. When you walk out tonight, you can forget everything Rochelle said. But whatever you're hearing from the Lord right now, let that penetrate into your heart. Hear the voice of the Lord. He is speaking. If you can't hear, then you need to get up where it's not staticky and it's not noisy so that you can do one-on-one -on -one time with him because he is speaking to you. He wants to comfort you. He knows your trial. He knows what's got you upset. He knows what's turned you upside down. And he's saying, comfort, comfort you. And oh, by the way, I will guarantee you, he whose Bible is falling apart doesn't. Do you get that? If your Bible's falling apart, you don't fall apart. If your Bible's in good shape, you might be the one falling apart. So, he whose Bible is falling apart doesn't. Just say it for Rochelle. There it goes out the window. <laughs> God is referring to his covenant people here, and he's going to make that clear. They're going to be the recipients because he's bringing them, the Messiah, to sit on the throne in Israel, on this earth, to bring about that peace. So yes, but can we apply it? Absolutely we can. Are we not called his children? Is he not our Father who is in heaven? We know that, with that he's speaking to us. He has promises for us also. So as we read and we hear, don't be afraid to apply it. Don't steal it from Israel. Don't say it's all mine. <laughs> but feel free to apply it as it fits. I love that as soon as he gets past telling you comfort and that it's coming from him, he's the one speaking and he is your God, that personal. Then he says, speak kindly. Or actually a better way is to speak tenderly. Speak to the heart. Now, if someone's really upset and you come in with a lot of anger, you don't do a thing to help the situation. But if someone is, is just really turning upside down and you come in quietly and with gentleness and with a tenderness and with a love, you will see it help the situation calm and settle down. And that's what he's saying. I've got an everlasting love for you, Israel. Yes, I know you're in trouble. I know that you have problems. They're because you brought it on yourself, but I'm here for you. And that's what God is trying to direct. He wants them to hear. He's sovereign. He's in control. The fact they're going into captivity is not because God lost the battle. It's not because it's out of God's control. It's not because he's up there ever saying hoi gavot. No, it is part of God's eternal plan to work in his children what is necessary to bring them into that right relationship with him. And all the way through, he's saying, study my word, hear my voice, know my heart, feel my love. And he says, cry out to her. And that's the next, speak kindly to Jerusalem. That's a, a, the euphemism for all of Israel. Then cry out to her. Remember Yeshua stood up loud and he cried out, said, all who are thirsty, come to me. He wasn't going to turn anyone away. Now, he's in a very Jewish setting, but I don't hear him turn you dear Gentiles away. <laughs> Remember, it's for you also. And in that strong and that clear proclamation and his voice of strength, we go into a future view. Verses, the next two verses, two and three in here, actually are what's called proleptic. And that means that it anticipates the future as if it's already happened. We say, signed, sealed, and delivered. And that's what God's saying. And he's basing it on his sovereignty. Because I am your God. Here's your future. And here's the comfort. This message of comfort, in verse two, there are three different ways that they're going to be comforted. We're going to read it here right now. Call out to her, cry out to her that her warfare has ended, her guilt has been removed, and she has received of the Lord's hand a double for all her sins. Now, as soon as you hear it that way, that sounds like, wait a minute, 
I'm in double trouble if I'm getting it for my sins. So you've got to know what the Hebrew is saying. You've got to get into what is being told here because these are the three areas that Israel needed comfort in. And God is bringing that to her in each one. The first one, that her warfare has ended. What he's saying is, yes, you're going off into captivity. Babylon's going to swallow you up. Babylon's already swallowed up Assyria. So all 12 tribes are, are under that captivity of Babylon. But he's saying it's ended. He knew it would come to an end. We know from future study, they had 70 years of captivity in Babylon in Daniel's day. Daniel knew just before the 70 years were about up, he got on his knees and he said, God, it's time. Isaiah, Jeremiah, we learned it was to be 70 years. And it was about 70 years. Oh God, bring us the Redeemer. Here they're being told, this is it, it's done. Your captivity is over. If you're in captivity or you're going into it, you're going to say, hallelujah, it's over. The second phrase, her iniquity is pardoned. Her guilt has been removed. That's also, wow, to have your sins removed. To know that that's forgiven, done away with, that is amazing. Again, it's looking forward. It hadn't happened that day. It wasn't going to happen that day. They were going to go off, but here is their future. And in that, that she's received from the hand of the Lord double for all her sins, that's an idiomatic um, expression. It's metaphorical. And what it means is that everything that needed to be done to accomplish, to deal with, with the issue, has been done. So everything in relation to her sins has been taken care of. It's like it, it's done double duty. It's, it's not just one way, but it's got a whole other layer on top of it. The best way I can think to say that to us is in Yohanan John 10, the Lord tells us that he has us in his hand. Mm -hmm. And then we hear that the hand of the Father is over the hand of the Son, and we see a double protection. This is what God's saying to Israel. Maybe, I'm guessing, maybe because we've got ten northern and two southern, I don't know, but for each one, for both of them being brought together, their sins are looked at as completely removed. Everything, the punishment, what they had to, to suffer because of their consequences, it's done. It's over. There's a future, and it's glorious. And that's why it's going to be such a comfort. So remember, as they're going into exile, they have to be thinking to themselves, what about the promises to King Nobi? Where's the one to sit on his throne? What about the promises to Avraham that they'd be a great nation, that they'd be the blessing to the world. What about these promises? And maybe they even cried them out to God and said, what's up? What's happening? God, are you forsaking your people? And you know what he says? Comfort you. Comfort you. Here's the end. He's the spoiler too. I love it. God likes to tell you the final chapter and he gives it to you ahead. You don't have to worry through it. They're going to go through all the way literally till today with Gentile world power. Israel is not head nation. Israel is not controlling what's happening in this world. And Israel is constantly being told by the Gentile nations what she should or shouldn't do, whether she listens or not. And I pray she does not because she knows better. <laughs> but all of this, they had to wondered, is it all over? Did we lose it? And God, in the midst of that, doesn't allow them a moment to think. They're forsaken. He makes it so clear. And he brings them verses to encourage them. When we're looking at verses 3 through 8, we're going to look that there's a pattern, there's a path that has to be formed. There's something that has to be done to bring about these promises. But I'm going to jump down to verse 5 for a minute because I want you to see the encouragement. Remember, 2 and 3 were written in the tense that the end has already happened. They're already on the other side of it. Verse 5 says, Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Wow. 
if the Lord has spoken it, nothing can change it. Nothing can come against it. And the whole world is going to see the glory of the Lord. We're going to come back to that in just a bit, but let me say also, we touched on the Shekhinah glory of the Lord. So let your mind go there. We're going to go back up to verse 3 and see how this is going to happen because we know the end now, but you could be questioning if you were an Israeli. Okay, God, I hear your promise, but how on earth are you going to get us from point A to point B? Well, I was going to say there were, there were a lot of years. Yes. A lot of Many years, years. When, when our people just said, okay, I don't think it's ever going to happen. I can't see from, I can't see how we're ever going to get that land. Yes. Again. Yes. Yes. And when the miracles started in 1948, the restoration of the nation of Israel, a nation born or reborn in a day, and they started rebuilding, and my mom and dad are there in 53 and 54, so it's young and it's early, and they're working in the, the fields, and it's hard work, it's hard labor, and, and the joke starts going out, you know, we prayed for this, we prayed for every generation has prayed for this, and it had to happen to us. <laughs> but yes, they did wonder, and they did think. You know, is it all over? Will we see it? But God was telling them, this is how it's going to happen. So verse 3, and I know I've got to tie it up real quick here. The voice of one calling out, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, or clear a road through the desert for Adonai. Okay, there's a road that has to be prepared. There's a necessary way that this is going to happen. And this heralding by a messenger, this was... This was Jewish culture. This was the Eastern culture. When a monarch would be coming, there would be an entourage that would go out first. They would see to it that the way was clear. That there wasn't, it's like rolling out the red carpet. You know, that there wasn't going to be a problem. There wasn't going to be something to come in to interfere. And notice that the messenger is not named. We don't know who the one crying out is. What mattered was the message. Now we, because we can look back and we see, we can know that this very, in my mind, definitely was a prophetic picture of Yochanan the Immerser, John the Baptist, who was crying out, making the way in the wilderness for the one who, was come, who would come, the Lamb of God, who Yochanan said, I have to decrease so he can increase. I'm not even worthy of taking his sandal off his foot. This is the one who would be crying out in the wilderness to prepare the way for the Lord. So we can look and see how the prophecy has been fulfilled. But we're going to come and go through this because what we're seeing is for the Israelis at this time, they had to flash back instead of forward because they can't see prophetically what we're looking back on has already happened. So all they can draw on is, well, we remember being down in Egypt. Mm -hmm. We remember 400 years. That's a long time, don't you think, Janet? Mm -hmm. Don't you think they were saying yeah. when? And they were in slavery by the end of those 400 years for many, many years. They were suffering, and yet they saw God redeem them. He brought them out of Egyptian bondage. He brought them out, and he met them at Mount Sinai. And he gave them his word. And he told them, you are my people. He showed his faithfulness to them then. And even though we say that Moshe was the redeemer, really, I, I kind of cringe when I hear that. I get it. Because it, in skin form on earth, but really God was our redeemer. God did the miraculous. Moshe led, but he led as God showed him how to go and what to do. And if you think for a moment that rod had supernatural powers that just putting it out over a big body of water could part it, dry it up, get the Israelis back, and then cause it to collapse, well, <laughs> then, uh, yeah, you know what? I'll go find you a frog out there, and you can kiss it, and it'll be your prince tonight, okay? <laughs> so they knew God redeemed. They knew that they needed to look for their Redeemer. He came to our people and brought them out of Egypt. Maybe God's going to come and bring us out of Babylon. 
You think? Yeah. You think that's what God's telling them? That is a special road. That road that has to be built is going to be the road that tells them the way to repentance. It's going to tell them the way to trust in their Messiah. It's going to tell them how to remove the obstacles. It's going to tell them how the whole nation needs to be for Messiah to come. Now, because I'm running out of time, I've got to just snapshot for you. Sadly, even though Israel is brought out of Babylon, and Israel is back in the land to some degree in the time of Yeshua when he came, and he walked among them, they hadn't learned at all. They were full of self-righteousness. They were full of pride. They were full of, I'm going to do it my way. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you, anytime you tell that to God, we look out. <laughs> So in Messiah's first coming, they did miss it. It's exactly what had been foretold. But in our Hebrew, and this is where I'll bring it back next time, we'll start, we'll look at Mount Malachi, and we'll look right here in Yeshua, Yeshahu, and it really looks like we're looking at two different aspects. And I believe we are, because Messiah came once, and Messiah is coming again. And I believe that it's right here in this. And as we go on through it, we're going to see that the verses that follow are going to show us everything about man is temporal. Everything about man is passing away. Everything about man. If you want self-sufficiency in man, but the comparison to God, and that's what we're going to start taking you through. You're going to see this God. Remember it talked about everyone's going to see his glory? We'll come back next week and I will show you how they're going to see. What does that mean? How's the world going to see? How's Israel going to see the glory of the Lord? Because right now, do you think Israel sees the glory of the Lord? So it obviously didn't happen at first coming. We've got another time coming. But we're going to see all the way through this, the frailty of man, the inability of man to rescue himself. Really? Do you want man's ways? You know what man comes up with? Oh, let me give you a drug for that. <laughs> let me get Which you into crap? a high position of, of prestige where you can call the shots. Give me anything man can throw at you. And I will tell you, I'll dump, dump all that in the trash can, just give me my God. Because He is the rescuer, He is the redeemer, He is the all-sufficient, He is on the nice of the oath, the Lord of the heavens, and the, the host of... I just want to get going, you're making me quit that thumb clock. <laughs> so it's come gone. back with me. We're going to be on a journey for a little while. We're going to stay with Isaiah because he's just got too much to say and is too relevant to us. But if you are in a time of need, I don't want to leave you in a, a point, a low point. I want to tell you, if you get into this word, if you hear, see, and apply, you are going to know what I'm going to be teaching next week. You're going to see the glory of the Lord at work in your life. Your circumstances may change. Your circumstances may not change. You know what will change? You. Me. That's what changes. And I'll tell you, there is nothing greater than the touch of God in your life. It will send you soaring with the eagles, even if it takes us three weeks to get there. Don't forget tonight, so I don't have to repeat it so we can fly next week. <laughs> I think that if there was ever a low point, or at least the beginning of a, the, a very low point, after the, the destruction of the second temple, I agree. Wow. I then they, it, it, they couldn't, there was no, nothing, I mean, there was no future to see. No. Nothing. No. So the whole future was based on that temple, and it's gone. Yeah. 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 I agree. So <coughs> I don't know how they first, I don't know how. I, uh, <laughs> maybe because of the hope that those who were prophetic speaking knew. Maybe that was it. I don't know. Um, 